Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, I need to adjust now my... So you're adjusting? Yeah, because I only get half the screen now, which isn't <laughs> what I would planned. How are you yeah, doing? Not be too close, otherwise you like, chop your face off. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Oh, when you when you join us, please say hello so we know that you're here. Um, welcome, welcome. Greetings from Kew Gardens. Lovely mm -hmm. Gardens. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, so I think it is seven o'clock. So um, yeah, I'm going to do like a little intro. Um, to tonight's session, tonight's queer well-being session. Mm -hmm. Before I do that, I just want to quickly let um, everyone who's joining live and watching on the replay know that I am just about, I bet you love, I bet you love Kew Gardens. <laughs> hey, Kirsty. Hi, Katrina. I am yeah, just going to let you know before we get going that I am about to launch a course. Um, it's the week after next. It's a course that I've put together because of the kind of fact that we're in lockdown right now. Mm. And um, I thought it'd be a really great opportunity for us to, you know, spend some time maybe going inward, looking at, you know, the things that maybe we don't sometimes give ourselves the time and the space to look at. And the course is really around authenticity and living truly as yourself. And what does that feel like? How do you know when you're doing it? I think we all know what it feels like when we're not doing it because it feels uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, sometimes we say yes to the things we don't want to say yes to and all that kind of stuff. So mm. that's what it's looking at. It's called dare to be you. And, um, the link to it will be in my bio after this, <laughs> after this live. And yeah, it's just something I've drawn together really, because I think now might be a great time for us to support ourselves um, and spend some time on that and getting really, it's really about getting comfortable and feeling proud about who we are, all of ourselves, you know, all of us, including our sexuality or gender identity. So if that's something that you think you might be interested in, check my bio after this live. Right, on with tonight. So I am really um, looking forward to this evening's session with George. Uh, so the well-being, queer well-being sessions are really all about giving us a space to explore what well-being means, you know, what kind mm -hmm. of different well-being practices can we um, apply in our lives to support ourselves and what I think is really important to me um, all the time, but I think now, especially in this sort of past since March in the UK, when we've had lockdown version number one, and now we're back in that, you know, there are a lot, I'm always reminding myself really, and anyone that will listen of all the queer people that um, aren't safe right now and even are, even are less safe than normal because maybe they've had to go back into family homes or difficult circumstances that means that they've perhaps had to go back in the closet and things like that and obviously there's a lot of um, mental health struggles already in our community and I know that George and I are going to touch on that tonight probably a bit more than touch on it you know um, but it's important to talk about this stuff and it's important to um, you know, really do what we can to support each other, I think. And I'm hoping that these sessions will help us all with that. So, George, and I'm going to ask um, you to share your pronouns and how you identify. Yeah, yeah. My pronouns are she and her. So I identify as a gay woman. So, yeah. Yeah. And mine are the same. So my pronouns are she and her, and I identify as a gay woman as well. Super duper. Okay. So, yeah. And I, I suppose a little bit about um, us and how we met. So we met here on Instagram, didn't we? But we've also met in person. <laughs> yeah, I think we did meet on Instagram. Yeah, I think we did. I can't remember. I fell on your page somehow and I was like, oh, this is very interesting. Um, and then I think I just connected. And then, yeah, then we, um, 
I went to a networking event and then someone there talked about you at the midlife hub and they said that you'd come oh, part okay. of that, which is a different platform. And then now we've got this little networking monthly call that we're on. So we've, we've spent a fair bit of time together the last couple of months. Yeah. We have. Yeah. We've got our monthly mastermind. Yes. I like to call it the mastermind. Yeah. So. Yeah. I like it. It's got a good ring. <laughs> it sounds impressive. It. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that's, that's just great, isn't it? Any sort of, like, opportunities, I think, to network with other business owners as well. It's like, yeah, definitely. To get insight from a business, from other it's, it's invaluable. So, yeah, I really enjoy those calls. Yeah, great to get that support, isn't it? Mm, mm. And, you know, getting that support and that sort of community that gets what it's like to, whether it's, like, be a business owner or be, you know, LGBTQ+. plus. Yeah. Um, yeah. again it's like so important I think mm. so we're gonna sort of dig in a little bit to your well-being journey and mm -hmm. how you ended up being a PT and an online fitness coach um, and then you're gonna take us through um, an exercise for yeah. us all to have um, explore uh -huh. and I think what I really like hopefully as well about these sessions is that people get something to take away to think about you know that will help them with their well-being so yeah. um yeah that's what we're going to do if anyone's got any questions as we go we'll try and pick those up we'll do our best <laughs> keep an eye on it um and yeah so how did you get into personal training and fitness where did it kind of all start tell us about that the decision came from a breakdown in tears in H&M changing rooms, actually, to the decision to get a PT at that point. But but initially, I'd really suffered with my mental health. Um, and I'd kind of put myself into a box because my family has, has got issues with me their mental health and not just anxiety and depression, which is quite serious in my family, but there's, there's history of bipolar and schizophrenia in my family tree is what my immediate family tree. So when I kind of became an adult, I'd already kind of put myself into this like box where I was like, oh my, this is me and this is my family. And I've got this serious anxiety and depression because that's it's hereditary or it's the, the deal that I've been given. And I kind of had this life where I just didn't take care of myself so I was heavily reliant on recreational drugs for like a long time. I started smoking weed when I was 11 and there was a lot of traumatic childhood experiences probably related to my family's mental health but a lot of a lot of trauma which then led to in my early well my teens and my early adult life so lots of drugs lots of alcohol cigarettes and then obviously I knew that was bad but also what I was putting into my body just the worst kind of foods that you could sometimes I would eat I would eat fast food daily um but sometimes I, I might even eat it two or three times a day um and I'd have like a an energy drink maybe three or four energy energy drinks a day and all this just on top of the alcohol and the the, the drugs I just I was just living this absolute terrible lifestyle. And then I would cry on my sofa and be like, oh, why is my anxiety and my depression so bad? And go to the doctors and get medicated. When actually all the things that I was putting into my body was just making it a hundred times worse. I was like paving this, this life for myself when I made this decision to change, actually, no, this isn't, this isn't how I want to live. This isn't what I have to accept. Like, yeah, my family have got mental health issues, but I don't have to sit and accept that. I don't have to live like that. And I kind of just made this decision that I wanted to change my life, even though my relationship at the time revolved around drugs. My friendships revolved around drugs. Like, my environment was just drugs and alcohol. And I was like, nah, don't, I don't want this anymore. And then started taking steps to kind of break out of it. And that's when exercise and diet kind of came into play basically so yeah yeah wow yeah 
And I think that's it's not it's not an uncommon kind of story, is it really? Um, Especially not in this community. Like yeah. it's the statistics of the LGBTQ plus community and their mental health is obviously yeah. we suffer m more because of everything that we've you know even just realizing that you're gay or non-binary or it's traumatic because you've got all this as a teenager all this stuff going on that you don't really understand and it's just it's, it's just hard to deal with so yeah suicide rates are very high in our community as well so yeah. it's, it's coping isn't it uh, some of those things that you were doing you know and um i now look back on you know my my kind of big crutch self-medication whatever you want to call it was alcohol you know yeah, yeah. and um it's a way of you know i'm not i'm much better now at really showing self-compassion around yeah. that you know i used to hate myself so much for the way that i abused alcohol um, yeah so many years um yeah i think a lot of people rely on alcohol a lot more than they tend to admit and you can have a healthy relationship with alcohol like i think you genuinely can but it's about finding that boundary and understanding your thresholds with alcohol and like it's a total difference having a group of friends and going out for dinner and having a, a glass or two of wine or having a group of friends and going out and having 10 drinks and 10 shots and just getting absolutely shit faced. I just don't, there's, there's two, they're worlds apart. And I just think you have to ascertain your environment and understand where you want to go with it. Cause there is, there is definitely a healthy relationship with alcohol. You just need to figure it out. Um, yeah. But, very, I think it's really individual as well. I think that's what I've begun to, what I have realized, I believe about that the choice and what will work for you and what won't you know I tried all of the things yeah cutting down only drinking at the weekend yeah you know all that kind of stuff and in the end I just knocked it on the head um because it was always like this um feeling of which we might talk about I don't know we might talk about it with the food thing you know but that feeling of denying myself and it was in like this voice, you know, all the time. Yeah. You do, how much you're going to have, you know, da, 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 you know, and it was like, stop. Yeah. I guess if for you it yeah, feels unhealthy, it, if it doesn't feel healthy in your head, like the decision that you're making and you're making, you're like, oh, shut up. Because I've done the same thing with alcohol because I used to, if I did it, the next day I would feel like I really let myself down um mm -hmm. but actually that's not healthy either really to look like, to not be able to have one and and feel that way so i haven't had a drink now for months like because i would just get to that point but it it totally depends on that like if you're waking up and you just feel so guilty then is it worth mm -hmm. is it worth that as well but i, I think there are mm -hmm. ways of of making it work yeah. for you and if it doesn't then yeah maybe the best thing for your mental health to do is to make an yeah. assessment it's, it's, it's that relationship isn't it the between the mind and the emotional kind of response to the actions that you're doing I yeah because well, for me it was very psychological I'm sure on a physical level I could have a healthy relationship with alcohol yeah there's what, what a lot I... of patterns and childhood sort of like you know alcohol dependency in my family and what I observed and what I now observe lots of triggers and stuff it's quite comic it can be quite I would say complicated because I think we can work this stuff out for ourselves you know through really exploring it but it yeah. for me and probably <laughs> for you is alcohol reminds me of an old life and now I've gone through such a period of growth that I don't know if alcohol really supports that that kind of mindset that I'm in anymore. Um, yeah. So, and yeah. that's why I know I know someone else that feels a bit guilty, and they've come from trauma and, and addiction, and now they they just like oh, I just I can't really drink anymore because 
it makes me feel guilty because you've spent so much time building yourself up and creating this person who you are now that you're proud of. But then if you have two, three, four, five drinks, you become that old person that you were. So that mm. that's how I feel with it. Mm. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like that. What's coming up for me, which sounds a bit like mm, woo-woo, but it's like that higher self, you yeah. know? It's like, we know, we know, we, I'm sure that you've done the same as me, you know, many people watching probably have done this as well, and sort of visualising who is your future self, you know? Yeah. Who is she and who do you want her to be and what do you, how do you need to show up to, to, to allow her to kind of come forward? Yeah. Um, and for you to be able to step into what that means and... Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, yeah so a bit of a and, and kind of how long when did it sort of start your kind of shift out of that kind of do you mean previous kind of view? <laughs> do you mean when i started to changing my lifestyle habits before yeah. that i got yeah. bloody, um it was 2012 so okay. a number of years ago now but at that point i still wasn't how so I got really into exercise and I made that lifestyle choice and that was great but I went in too deep because I still had so many mental health issues so I was over training I was training like maybe 10 times a week so I was over training and under eating because I hadn't mm -hmm. really hadn't addressed any issues that I had so my diet was a bit better and I was exercising so my mental health had bettered somewhat but it wasn't it wasn't great and I was still putting cocaine up my nose every every weekend so it didn't it still didn't fit but I did that for a number of years because I was working at a bank and I was still in a relationship that revolved around drugs and alcohol mm. so I just couldn't break away from that lifestyle so even though in the week I was like oh yeah and I convinced myself that I was doing the right things, but in my head, I was still having time off work for anxiety and depression on the regular because I was just still treating my body with such disrespect, basically. So, yeah, yeah it was. It was only. It's only been since 2016 where I've started to go on a, a journey as it were with like my my actual mental health and the mm. last couple of years it's been i've just made a lot more connections with what i eat and what i drink and, and how i feel as opposed to just as food just being fuel i don't really agree with that basically everything we eat and drink affects the way we feel think and behave and there is always some some sort of impact positive or negative you put something in your mouth something happens in your body and mm. it is always going to happen but a lot of people just don't ascertain that it's what they put in their mouth that's what's done it and even the same for water or anything you just put inside you you can't not expect some sort of reaction and once i got my head around that then i realized that i could control my body thoughts and my work my well-being and my mental health a lot better if that makes sense mm. yeah mm. yeah I'll dig into that a bit in a minute um, mm. so you in terms of what would you say like how did you kind of get to that point where you say like you you kind of got on your journey and realized that you could make some changes and what were the sort of things that started happening or that you must have tried stuff or explored something and then felt the change, felt something shift or? In terms of what was, I, I discovered that certain things were triggering me. So I became very aware of when I put something into my body, how I would feel 15 minutes later. So I decided mm -hmm. to try and kind of ascertain what, what might do things to me mentally. Yeah. Um, what get what what sort of um to, to sort of interrupt you but I'm curious about like because you know there's mindless mindless sort of eating and consumption yeah. stuff, isn't there mm. um, 
that some of us might do just in front of the TV, you know, like for that period of time, or it might be all the time, or it might be when something shit happens, you know, there's that sort of emotional eating and there's sort of mindless where you don't even really, you're not connected to your body. Yeah. So you can't, and I know you've said to me before that you feel very sensitive now to what you eat and the response that your body has. Yeah. So I'm curious to kind of, I'd love to know what it is that got you to that place where you were able to recognize the response your body was having. Do you know? And <laughs> yeah, the, everyone's going to be really upset to, to hear it. But the, the first thing that made me realize was coffee. Um, <laughs> That's why we're going to be upset. <laughs> well, I was, I was a, complete, <laughs> coffee. a complete coffee addict. I actually used to make a, a flask, you know, like a thermos, a litre mm. of coffee at night and take it to bed with me, right? Wow. And then when my alarm went off in the morning, I'd be like, oh, so I didn't have to get out of bed. That was when I broke up with that partner. I, I, we broke up in 2016 and I, I wasn't getting <laughs> tea or coffee brought to me in bed anymore. And I was like, oh, I need to to figure this out because otherwise I can't get out of bed. It's ridiculous. So yeah, you just take a liter of coffee to bed. Um, I drink a liter of coffee before I'd even gotten out of bed and then get on with my day. And then I'd have two coffees at work, two teas, and I'll just be fueling my day with caffeine for the whole day. And yeah. obviously at that point, I just didn't have any idea. And I, my anxiety was so bad. I obviously used to take medications for it. But sometimes I'd just walk into the office. This is when I was in the office. And um, I would just burst into tears or, or be crying under my desk because I felt so anxious. I felt like a little, like a feeling of despair in my chest. Like that's what, and it gets really big when I feel anxious. And I just, I managed, one day, I couldn't remember, I had a panic attack. Um in the gym, so I was part-time gym, part-time banking, and I'd bought a coffee from the coffee shop next door, and within five minutes of finishing it, I ended up having a panic attack under the desk and crying, mm. and, which was horrendous. And then that was the first time I was like, oh, because I hadn't done anything. There was no anxiety before that at all. And I was like, how, and I know sometimes panic attacks come on suddenly, but, I just made that connection and then from there I started delving into it um, yeah. and it became quite a big thing and it took me quite a long time to get to the realisation that I had to break up with coffee but mm. it got to a point where I was like what is more important, my mental health or having the taste of coffee which I can actually still have with decaf and not have panic attacks or not feel yeah. anxious or jittery. Like have a coffee before a job interview and be like, like just the worst thing I could have ever done. So yeah, it took me a lot of testing. So I was like five coffees a day, four, three, two, one, coffee at the weekend, coffee before a workout. And then it, it just got to a point where I was having one coffee a week and then the rest of the day I'd be written off. I'd be on the, on the couch watching Friends because I was anxious. So I was like, this is stupid. So I just, mm. I quit. And then from there, it was lots of, lots of realizations about everything that I put in me affects me in a certain way. If I can yeah. figure that out, then I can work it to my advantage. Yeah. And, and make it work for me when I need to feel good and when I don't need to feel good, etc. Yeah. Decaf is real good these days, you know, guys. So, I mean, it's worth, having a little decaf every now and then and just seeing how it makes mm. you feel and it's still got the tiniest bit of caffeine in it yeah, yeah. so for me it's it, when you were talking there about the coffee and like you know breaking up with it and you know the experimenting that you were doing and stuff I was thinking about how it's almost like it's a bit of a gift that you've got now that you can understand those you know what the impact of what it is that you're putting in your body is having and share that you know share that with your clients share that with 
you know, the people that may be in your life that are kind of going, I don't know why I'm feeling like X, Y, and Z. And yeah, it's, um, it, it, yeah. We, <laughs> it's made me very aware. So now everything I put into my body, I feel it. Mm. And, and I have to gauge the times. So like, I really love a chocolate brownie. I love a chocolate brownie. And I, that's like my nice little treat. But I have it at the weekends when I'm not working or might feel stressed about something. You know, I'm relaxing and I have a chocolate brownie. And then I'm going home and have a nap and not like have yeah. to. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of plan the things that I want to eat in relation to what I've got on now, if that makes sense. And I feel. Yeah. I'm quite lucky to be able to make that connection with food, but mm. I, if anyone can do it, it's really, it's really easy. Yeah. And I'd say since I've, I now, I made my own ca caffeine assessment. So now my caffeine limit is one normal tea a day. Cause if tea was doing it as well, tea was making me anxious, but I can wake up in the morning, have one normal tea. So I've done all my notes and I was like, felt like this, felt like that. I made a little anxiety diary in relation to caffeine. And then got it down to the right, I can have one tea in the morning a day and that's it. And then it's decaf after that. But that's like a level for me that is no anxiety, no panic attacks, touch wood, since, since I've done yeah, that. And, yeah, and obviously I imagine everyone's different. Yeah, and, so someone um, might be one coffee in the morning and that's it. Or, yeah. or, or you know, everyone has to make their own assessment thing. Yeah. And so am I right in thinking you're not on medication for your anxiety now? Is that right? No, no. I haven't medicated for anxiety or depression for like a few years now. For, for yeah. years. I still have propranolol. Uh, propranolol? The, the beta blockers in the cupboards for a long time, but I haven't, I haven't taken them. For, I haven't needed mm. to. Like, I haven't drunk coffee now. Must be coming up three years in January, so I just haven't even needed it at all. Yeah. So, so, and before that, you were on them for quite a long time, a few years or something. I would take antidepressants more than anxiety medications. So I would take beta blockers when I felt really like um, panicky. But yeah, not since I started exercising, I hadn't taken any medications for that. So that was since two thousand and twelve. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So mm, wow. And um so I'm wondering about I'm thinking about like people watching and um their sort of in terms of your overall kind of like philosophy if you like or approach to um wellness and fitness and that noticing that relationship between your mental health and mm -hmm how you take care of yourself what are the kind of key key principles you think we should all be thinking about you know this is like um an, an invitation to think about these things and to maybe yeah as a away. whole as a whole like yeah as a whole. so obviously exercise is a big thing um for your mental health and your well-being but i, I think a lot of people assume that they have to do an hour's workout every day to to get the the benefits from it. Um, but I've I've figured out really. So sometimes I'll work out just for endorphins. So if I've done a workout, maybe I'll, oh I'm on a rest day, so I don't want to lift any weights that day. I will get on the treadmill for five minutes, and I, for me, I figured out that it only takes five minutes to release endorphins into my body and make me feel good and yeah. yeah it has to be a little bit more intense than than walking i think walking is great for your, your mental health but in terms of getting your heart rate up you don't always get that buzz as it were yeah. so but like you could do dancing as well couldn't you and get the same kind of like yeah, you say yeah it could it be anything it changes your vibration doesn't it it changes your vibration your energy and gives you like you say those those good feeling hormones exactly hormones? Like hormones. yeah endorphins yeah oh. that yeah and um they they also work as a painkiller so in some respects endorphins are even stronger than morphine and um, it's been it's been studied and people when they're in pain they're like oh i can't do anything i've hurt i've hurt this or, 
and obviously it depends on what that is if you've like broken your back obviously i'm not telling you to get on the treadmill but nine times out of ten if you've got a bit of backache or you're i don't know feeling a little bit under the weather with something if you if you get your heart rate up just for four or five minutes it's going to make you feel better like no one ever ever regrets when they've done exercise because mm -hmm. of the endorphins it just makes you feel yeah, good yeah. so I, I will exercise purely for endorphins now on my off days mm -hmm. and if I don't do it early so if I get to 5 p.m and I don't I haven't done it I feel grotty and I'm just a bit sluggish and not motivated and I just get my heart rate up so you could do star jumps literally 100 star jumps and you're gonna <sighs> It just changes hundred. <laughs> just wow, well, you know, whatever works for you. Enough to get you your heart racing. And the difference is the difference that way between you, you feel before and after is is incredible. So that's my first thing. Like mm -hmm. you will never regret moving your body. Never. It's it's just not gonna happen. And you don't have to do it for an hour. And I think that's why people put it off. You can do sure. squats. And a plank for five minutes. You do ten squats, do a little bit of plank, ten, and then in in five minutes you'll be like busting. Yeah, Bussing. it's true. No, it's, I, I do agree with you. Like even you know, like all the times you're like, oh, God, it really hurts. It's really hard, and all yes. of that. <laughs> and then afterwards, you you always feel good. It's yeah, true. definitely. <laughs> so that's that for me is like obviously one of the fundamental parts of it, and obviously diet. I just. I just don't see how you can have your best physical and mental health if you put a lot of shit and sugar in you all the time. Obviously, like I said before, there's time and a place where you want to have something that you really enjoy. Yeah. But if you're doing it yeah. on the regular... Well, there's a chemical, isn't there a chemical... There's a chemical response as well that happens when you put certain... It's like cortisol goes up, goes up, and stuff that, like that. That happens that. with coffee like, as well. That's a stress hormone, isn't it? So with so, coffee and, yeah. and certain food, like the cortisol and the adrenaline response, basically. So yeah. most people in this, in this world, probably, there's like two trains they're on, if you like. So they're on the coffee train, and then they're on the sugar train. This is like a really bad enough, but anyway, like you have to go with it. So there's this train, all right, and they're going, and then so on the coffee train, it's going real, real fast, and they're like, yeah, buzzing, okay. And then that train slows down, and they get on the sugar train, and that one goes really fast, and they're like, oh yeah, great. And then that one slows down, and they and they just keep hopping between one train and the other. So like throughout the day, they're like coffee, sugar, down, down, coffee, sugar, down, like like this, and on a constant wave of up and down and up and down and not stable at all yeah. and we're all like we've all we're all doing it and it's just a disaster in my opinion for your mental health because you're not you haven't got any stable moods or thoughts or or feelings because coffee is a drug it's a stimulant and we're all just we're all all over mm -hmm. it and obviously the sugar and the processed food like we just yeah we're none of us yeah. on this like level train where we're just exhausting like... because it's exhausting just you know hearing you talk about it and think about it really i mean what the fuck that's doing to our bodies um it's just that constant stress low level stress that we're causing by what we're putting in it isn't it basically yeah. and it's sad because that it's not only that and your physical health like it's, it's so inflammatory all the the sugar and yeah and there's so many chronic illnesses and and there's just so much that can be prevented through mm -hmm. just a few little tweaks to your diet. So, yeah. Do you know? Do you want to um, talk us through your exercise? Yeah, you yeah. So, basic, it's really basic. Um, if you get, so I've got a little sheet here. It just says positive and negative. So basically, I did this in a, a networking event before. Did a little talk where just take a couple of minutes and write down foods that make you feel mentally positive and foods that make you feel mentally negative. I'm not talking about when you're eating it. Like, so when you eat a pizza, you're like, this is positive, it's delicious. So I'm not talking about that. Um, I'm talking about how you feel 20 minutes afterwards. So try and, okay. try and connect to how you 
the, the food makes you feel basically. So you could put alcohol on there, um, chocolate, coke, you know, whatever. Just take a couple of minutes and write some things. Um, yeah, some things on there, and then we can talk about it. Okay. And if anyone's got any questions for George, please feel free to um, ask them while she's here. While you're thinking about it. So food or drink food that or may drink. You, give you a positive or a negative feeling 20 minutes later. There's no... Bell some people will write different things. Yeah, some people will write... Diff obviously, everybody's different. Um, the point of it is to make you connect to how it makes you feel. Basically. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. And I thought we'll talk through yours, your answers. Sis. My answers. Yeah. Well, I already talked through mine a little bit. Through my answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one here. <laughs> Can't really talk for anyone else. No, no, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um. Go into my dark secrets of food. <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying to think if there's more. Oh, yeah. Don't think there's going to be any surprises, really. I think it's quite common. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's most people would have written the same things, I'm sure. Yeah. What I probably would first say is I'm sure your negative column is longer than your positive column. Or am I wrong? Um, yeah, I think it's, it, what I've found is that the negative column comes really quick. Yeah. It's like in the forefront of my mind. And that might be because I notice it, maybe, you know, like, I do notice it. I think, oh, I shouldn't be having this. Oh, it's, you know, it's like that. Oh, God, it's like, and I know, I know that that's not healthy it's not a healthy way to be looking and thinking about it it's, but I, I'm it's, aware that I do it it's the same um, as I don't know going to a restaurant you always remember the bad experiences I guess um but the point of that so when, most times I've done this and they've always heard more on the negative side like my my negative side is much longer um and I'm sure there's actually more on the negative that I could put on there. But the point being that we don't acknowledge how good we feel after we've eaten something nice. Yeah. So if you make salmon and roasted veg and rice, you yeah. you just don't sit on the couch and be like, oh yeah, I'm absolutely <laughs> buzzing after that. Like, <laughs> and I think we should be like, I think we should get to a point where we are like that because. Unfortunately, the negative experiences, they trump it. And then you think, oh, that made me feel crap. And we just still do it again anyway. But you have this acknowledgement of it. But when really you need to acknowledge how good you feel after certain foods. So like I put oats. I eat so many oats. But they make me feel, they release energy sustainably. And when I work out, I always feel better if I've had porridge in the morning um, than when I haven't. So they, that's the food for me that I've noticed that makes me feel really good. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's, that's one part, that's the one positive takeaway from this exercise is about recognizing when something makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, yeah. so what have you got? I'll tell you what's on my list if you like. Yeah. It's, um, a few things. I'm not telling the whole list. It's on the bad side, on the dark side. On the dark side, <laughs> yeah. I've got, uh, cake, biscuits crisps mm. chocolate mm. um like crap chocolate like cabbage and stuff like that um i've got one that i'm quite uncomfortable admitting but i will as we're all friends here <laughs> diet coke diet coke does it oh. make you feel negative though or are you just saying that because you know it's negative yes i'm saying it's it i know it's it's not great i know it's not great and it's kind of been my, because when I gave up drinking, I sort of started to like 
have Diet Coke. And yeah. I don't have loads of it. I don't want to talk a lot about my Diet Coke habit. <laughs> but it is the one thing I think, oh, I really kind of need to let that go. And I'm having, I'm, I've kind of switched to kombucha now. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, I love kombucha, and it's kind of like it, it's replacing it, sort of. So kombucha is incredible. On the better so, part, yeah. Um, and then in the good side, um, I've got things like, like you said there, really. You know, the things that I know make me feel good. So veggies, salad. Mm. Um, I have got raw chocolate on that good side. Ah, dark um, chocolate, yeah. Yeah, raw dark chocolate, yeah. yeah. Um, quinoa, rice, dolls, I like dolls mm. and sort of veggie curries and mm. stuff like that. Mm. Chilies, um, like veggie chili. I yeah. don't really eat meat, and, but I do eat fish. So occasionally I'll have fish okay. um, and stuff like that. Yeah, so... Did... This is the big question. Stuff. This is the, the biggest thing for this whole exercise. Did you put water on your positive side? Oh, no, I didn't put water. It's devastating. It's devastating, isn't it? So that's another another huge thing. Yeah. Is that nobody really no. understands or oh, we know we're supposed to drink water. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're supposed to drink water. But in terms of your physical and your mental health, it's... You can't, your body's got so many functions that it needs to do, like digestion, brain function, liver, whatever, all these things that it has to do. And if you're dehydrated, it has to start prioritizing what it's doing. And things don't mm. happen properly. And it's like, so, so water is, is, is imperative for, for hormone production. And if, if you're not, so if you're dehydrated and hormone production maybe is a little, in your body a little bit lesser on the priority scale because your body's got to breathe and, you're, you know, all these digestion, all these things are happening. And if you're dehydrated, then maybe hormone production is down here for you and you're not producing enough serotonin or all these things to make you feel good. And it's like, if I have a day where I've been really busy, I'm partially even just talking about it now, I just want to drink. Um, I've been really busy and I've had less water that day. By the end of the day, I feel like crap. And mentally, I just feel exhausted and sometimes a little bit teary and self-doubt like self -doubt coming in. Um, and I, I just, all these things go on in my head and I'm like, oh, I've only drunk half a litre of water today and I'm used to drinking three litres. Um, so in terms of your mental health, in terms of your physical health and having the peak, physical and mental health that you can have i just think water is is up there with exercise and mm -hmm. eating well your your water intake has to be high otherwise you're really going to struggle to get all those processes that you want your body to do it's just yeah, yeah. cells don't work properly do they if they're not hydrated so and so then, much yeah. doesn't work properly <laughs> if you're not and not that we're talking about this but weight loss as well weight loss fat loss is a priority for the body that's quite low down in terms of all the other things that we spoke about so if you're dehydrated it makes weight loss harder you need you need to fuel your body with water if you want it to do the things that you want it to do so yeah. and people don't put that on their positive side they don't think about it mm. you need, to, need to drink more water oh, I'm so yeah. Mm. yeah i think people i think um possibly people sort of get all the the messages around drinking water but what I don't hear enough is enough of is why you know and the so it's the elimination isn't it and the yeah. elimination is like what our body needs to do to kind of keep it in flow and keep it like the movement otherwise everything just gets stagnant exactly the first not thing not working homeostasis is what you want so when everything's in a neutral balance in your body that's that's what everybody wants. So that's what everybody's thriving for, essentially. And you need to have water for that. If I have a, a client come for a free PT session, and if at the end of it they they can't afford it, or for whatever reason we don't train together, I say something like, "Look," because they've told me that their mental health isn't great. I'm like, if you want to change your mental health tomorrow, the one thing you could do. 
that doesn't cost any money is open your mouth and pour more water in it. And I guarantee for people who have literally don't drink water right now, they just drink tea, coffee and whatever. If they start to drink two litres to, depending on their size, but two to three litres of water a day, within a week, they will be feeling a lot better and a lot more perky and energised and motivated. And when I have new clients and I make them do it, a week later they come back and they're like, oh, I feel really good already. And I'm like, I think most of that is for the water. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I always find it quite um, fascinating sometimes that there are people that don't drink any water. <laughs> like, that used to be me. It's like, I'm wow. Like, water. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not drinking that. No way. <laughs> yeah, so I've been there. Oh. Right. Okay. Well, that was um, really insightful, and hopefully, people found that um, thought-provoking. If anyone's got any questions, do let me know. I'm just having a look at the comment. Got a thumbs up for kombucha. Kombucha <laughs> is what I tell clients if they've got a fizzy drink addiction, and they're spending a lot of money. I tell them to go and buy. So if they buy it in their meal deal, I tell them to buy kombucha because you can buy it in cans now. And yeah. psychologically, yeah. they're still getting the fizzy hit. Yeah, the fizzy hit. Exactly. Yeah. But then it's all the good gut, the gut building bacteria <laughs> in it that are, again, really essential for mental health as well. So kombucha yeah. is, is, yeah, yeah. It's good for you at the same time. Mm. Katrina says, unless it gives me food poisoning, it's all good. And that's exactly it. Like, Everything on the negative side, that still doesn't mean that you shouldn't develop a relation. It shouldn't be bad that you can't eat those things. So, like, I put pizza on my negative side because after I eat pizza, I'm just like, oh, I just feel dead. But sometimes I really want to eat a pizza. So I order it at a time where I don't need to feel like I'm doing nothing afterwards. I sit on the couch and watch TV or something, and that's when I have it. So, yeah, every... I don't really want it to associate foods with like a positive experience and a negative experience more about just recognizing how it makes you feel. But that doesn't mean that you can't eat it because mm. there shouldn't be any foods that you should restrict yourself from just understanding mm. when the best time to have it is. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And then that starts leading into unhealthy, unhealthy relationships with, with it. And that. Yeah. 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 Another another problem yes yes that's it that's it mm -hmm. okay well we've overrun a little bit i'm so sorry i do oh that's all right <laughs> i i allowed i allowed it to happen <laughs> <laughs> i think it was really good i think it was really um yeah really really helpful and valuable so thank you so yeah. much no no worries um, um, thank you to everybody who has joined um we'll be here again next friday every friday for a while i said november but it might stretch a little bit beyond november we'll see yeah. um so thank you so much george for your time that's okay really i enjoyed it i'm gonna have my dinner now yeah what are you having i made a three bean chili in the slow cooker actually Ooh. so i'm very excited i'm very excited sexy yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah thank you for having me you to say to that <laughs> <laughs> becky's giving us a thumbs up <laughs> becky's in the other room watching it she's been told to keep the dog quiet that that was a, uh -huh. a worry we didn't, for get, me. we didn't get we didn't get to see barbs no no she's in there but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping that an Amazon delivery or something didn't come as well, so she barks at the door. Um, but yeah, all good, all safe on the bar. No worries. No worries. Cool. Okay, catch you all next week. Remember to check my bio for my new course. If you missed that at the beginning, I've got a new course which I've just launched today. Have a look at it. And yeah, we'll catch you next Friday. Thank you so much, George. Take care, everybody. Thank you. See you later. Bye. -bye.